What I'd like to do today is, as Chris has suggested, look at some of the process sitting behind the intergovernmental system and particularly the way the IPCC is working with our scientific community. I think if there's a message that I've got out of the process now that I'm inside that intergovernmental process uh, is on the power still of science and scientists inside the IPCC. We had an interesting debate yesterday about the role of scientists in decision making and policy making and someone made the remark that, uh, I'll paraphrase it, uh, no way in hell should scientists be allowed to run policy. In this case in IPCC, it is the science and the scientists that rule. And I knew that before I got into it, but it's certainly evident now, having been inside the Bureau for uh, four years. Go straight to the working group two, which is the impacts, adaptation and vulnerability part uh, of the fifth assessment, three chapters, uh, uh, first one on the physical basis, the third on, on mitigation. This time around, there's a slight change in the, in the approach. There are 20 uh, sectorial chapters. Uh, you see them there in front of you. Many of you, uh, a lot of you here, are in fact either involved as authors or as contributing uh, authors and are probably very familiar now uh, with the structure of the uh, second report. A lot of chapters, 20 chapters times around eight to nine authors plus a couple of review editors. I mean, just in this part alone, there's well over 200 uh, people involved. And that's not counting the contributing authors. Uh, you can double, perhaps even go up to 500 uh, counting those. So already, just looking at this part of the report, it's a big effort. The changes from uh, AR4, a number of changes. Uh, the foundations for decision making is uh, an innovation in this report. Uh, even more emphasis on ocean systems. Uh, we have a coastal chapter as well as the ocean system chapter and as I'll mention later, uh, a third element of that. A focus on urban areas and rural areas which uh, wasn't there in the last chapter. Key economic sectors and services, human security. Livelihoods and poverty is a new chapter. Perhaps the most significant change is the emphasis on adaptation, which given uh, the amount of people involved in this conference is perhaps apt. Four chapters directly involved in assessing adaptation science. I think we will find out in 2014 whether that was perhaps one chapter too many, but on the balance of all the advice and that we had from governments and scientists, this seemed the right approach uh, at the time. So certainly a significant amount of work that is being done now as part of the assessment. Part B, as we call it, of working group two is around uh, the regional assessments. In these cases, they are not only focused on material from working group two, but also bringing in material from working group one on the physical basis and as uh, appropriate and as the timing permits, material from working group three on, on mitigation. Uh, this structure is somewhat similar to, to what we saw in AR4, particularly the regions from chapter 22 uh, through to 27. Then the two specific chapters on the polar regions and on small islands. The one difference from AR4 is we decided to complete the global uh, coverage by including a, a, a chapter which is called uh, Open Oceans. Uh, that does mean that we have a very strong emphasis on oceanography in working group two, which I am just absolutely tickle pink about. Right from the start, there's been a focus on making sure all the cross-cutting themes between the working groups were covered and that these were all receiving attention. Uh, each of the co-chairs of the working groups are really spending a lot of effort to make sure that these themes are followed and picked up as we go through the assessment process. The fact that there's about a six months phasing between working group one and two and two and three does make that a little bit difficult, but that's something we've wrestled with in previous assessment reports uh, and it will be a challenge here just like it has been in previous assessments. But in the, in the post AR4 uh, review of you know, lessons learned, uh, one of the emphases there were, was that we needed to up our game in looking at across chapters and making sure these sorts of cross-cutting themes were picked up properly and there was consistent stories being told between the chapters. 
Uh, the IPCC vice chairs in principle also have a, a key role in, in overseeing uh, uh, the development of the three working groups. You won't be able to see the detail, but I couldn't find a better diagram in this than hunting around last night. Uh, this tries to capture the IPCC process, and I suspect for three quarters of the audience here, uh, this is not telling you anything you don't know already. Uh, it starts with the, uh, if you like, the, the decision on what the outlines, what's going to be assessed. Uh, in this case, that started back in 2008 with the uh, selection or election of the IPCC panel, and then in 2009, agreement uh, from governments on what the outlines of each of the chapters should look like. And depending on which chapter you're in, uh, in IPCC, you'll go from seeing almost no change from that outline to seeing a fairly significant restructure. And if that follows working group one, there's probably been very little, if any, change. Working group three, there's been some restructuring to try and make it a more effective chapter. Uh, and it, it is a long process. This goes over about six years. Working Group 1 will uh, have its final approval session in uh, October or in, in 2013. October? October. October. Uh, working Group 2 is March 2013 and Working Group 3 is a couple of months later. Uh, this just shows you where we're at at the moment. Uh, working Group 1 has gone through the first order draft process. Uh, had well over 10,000, I think it's closer to 15,000 review comments, and they're closing in on the second order draft. Uh, working Group 2 has released its first order draft for expert comment, uh, and I'll say this once, and I'll probably say it several times. For those of you who could add value by providing expert comments, please, please register and do what you can to improve the chapters by providing expert review. Working Group 3 is very close to finalising its first order draft. The Working Group 2 schedule, we've been through two lead author meetings. The third one is coming up in, in October. The key point for us now is the uh, expert review, which opened on the 11th of June and will close on the 6th of August. Not on the 16th of August, not on the 14th, it will close on the 6th of August. Uh, IPCC has very strict deadlines for producing material and for the review process. We cannot even let a day slip uh, in, in the schedule. That's how tightly it needs to be managed. Uh, again, please register, please provide your comments. If there was one thing I think was a message out of the review of IPCC with respect to review, is that we do tend to have a very uneven review. Some chapters can have up to you know, 5,000 or more comments. Some chapters and some parts of chapters sometimes don't receive any comments at all. And that really is a weakness that we're trying to address by encouraging people, in fact, going out and soliciting comment in review if we think uh, the review isn't attracting the right attention uh, in all the spots that we need. For us, the, the next point uh, is the lead author meeting uh, in October, and as you can see on the right, uh, the government and expert review will start in late March uh, next year. There's already been a massive amount of work done by the 300 or so people involved directly as authors. Uh, there is still a mountain of work, and I can only just sit in the, in the bureau and admire the great work that all of the authors do in Working Group 2 and the other chapters. It really is a selfless crowd that came in, come in and do this service for, for science uh, and for governments. The process is being informed by a lot of work that's being done uh, uh, in the background. There was some great work done a year and a half ago looking at the way we approach uh, uncertainty and the representation of that in the chapters. A guidance note was released, uh, co-authored by all of the three working groups. Uh, in this assessment, we're trying very, very hard to make sure that there's a, a traceable account of all of the findings that come through the reports into the, uh, the synthesis for, for policymakers. 
Uh, for those of you who have read the special report in extremes, you'll have seen the first trial of this much more explicit and transparent traceability in that report. And I think by and large from the way uh, the uh, approval session worked, I think that was a great improvement. Uh, people could see why conclusions were being made and can trace it back to the text and from there back into uh, the underlying scientific publications that were sitting behind it. I think it is a very important part of the working groups and for those of you who have started reviewing chapters in, in working group two, I think you'll find there that we probably still have a little bit of work to do to make sure there's an even and consistent approach to the way we, uh, we represent uncertainty. Sitting behind that uh, guidance note is a, a very simple approach. Evaluate the evidence and agreement. If there's insufficient evidence, just present summary terms. If there is sufficient evidence, uh, give some sort of uh, probabilistic uh, assessment of how good that evidence is. Uh, on, on the one, cent, uh, one part is the degree of agreement, and on the other, if you like, is the amount of evidence that you have available. And by conveying this information, you can convey to the audience, to the policy makers, just what is behind whatever statements that you're making. Is there a lot of consensus or a lot of disagreement? Is there a lot of evidence or is it based on just one or two uh, papers? This then goes down to the next level where we look at if uh, it's appropriate to look at the likelihood and probability of certain events occurring. Uh, this is based on a, a table which is very similar to the one that was adopted or the approach that was adopted in, in AR4. Uh, and we're again encouraging all authors when they're looking at probabilistic terms, if you like quantitative assessments, to follow as closely they can uh, this table. Uh, for some of us, even in re uh, reviewing material that's, if you like, of a national basis or on an agency basis, I now just by habit go through and if someone's saying it's critical, it's very likely, it's almost certain, going back and checking the consistency with the language we adopted uh, intergovernmentally and, and internationally. Special reports are a key part of the uh, assessment process. <clears throat> In this cycle, there are two special reports, uh, one following uh, renewable energies, uh, which was led out of working group three. And the second was a special report on extremes, which was led by working group two, but with significant contributions from working group one, and in some part from working group three uh, as well. Uh, the science and the assessments in some sense was business as usual. As always, the scientists who wrote the report just did an outstanding job of assessing uh, the science as it is today. And I would recommend anyone who is working in this field to work through the, the summary for policymakers uh, and as appropriate to work deeper into the report, which was released in March of this year. One of the lessons again that we have learnt is around communication and outreach. And in this case, with uh, Working Group 2 largely in the lead, there really has been a significant effort to take the material of this special report out on a regional basis. Uh, to seven regions to date, uh, Working Group 1 and Working Group 2 have worked together in exposing the science that's been assessed and exposing the conclusions being available for, for interaction with local scientists and with the media. We hope to also do a similar workshop in the Southwest Pacific uh, if time permits. <coughs> I, I think if I was looking for a single diagram, and I think there's already been a lot of discussion, particularly in working group two, about key diagrams and working on messages that can be conveyed in a, uh, in a, a pictorial sense, in a schematic sense, this diagram, which was capturing the, the vulnerability, exposure, uh, disaster risk uh, uh, interaction, I think is probably the key one to understanding the thought process behind the special report and extremes. And I'll be very surprised if this doesn't also make its way uh, into the uh, working group two assessment, because I think it is very, it is almost fundamental and key to the way we're approaching our tasks in working group two. The assessments are also informed by a number of expert meetings. Uh, these are in, in the processes of IPCC operated differently. Experts are invited for their expertise, smaller gatherings, you might call them workshops. 
uh, but they're very important because it gives an opportunity to debate and discuss where particular areas are in terms of their science and to use some of that work as, a, as an input to all of the working groups. There are five key ones other than the guidelines which I've already mentioned. Uh, early on, an expert meeting on detection and attribution. A couple of people in the audience here I know were directly involved on this. This is feeding through both into working group one and in working group two. Uh, a second, which was held immediately after our first order, a lead author meeting in Tsukuba, uh, Japan, it was on ocean acidification, which again is becoming a very important aspect of the climate change problem and a very important part of the fifth assessment, again with both working groups one and working group two involved in assessing the science. Human settlements, water, energy, and transport and infrastructure, as an expert uh, meeting which is informing both working groups two and working group three uh, with more of the emphasis in working group three. When I last looked, this still hadn't been published. Uh, so uh, if you want uh, any information from this report, you'll have to go into the working group three TSU. Uh, the fourth is that it was an expert meeting on economic analysis, costing and methods. This was held in Lima, Peru last year. Uh, for working group two, this again underpins a lot of the work in the latter sectorial chapters and will be, will be very important in informing the way the assessments there are done. And finally, but not least, again, uh, joint between, in this case, each of the working groups, one, two and three, was an expert meeting in geoengineering uh, held next to, uh, also held in Lima, Peru. And as uh, most people in this audience would know, this is a topic which was not going away and is probably going to become more prominent as we go through the fifth assessment process uh, and beyond. I'm just going to finish with a couple of comments on the review of the IPCC. Uh, in some ways, the IPCC, if you tried to invent it today, I just don't think it would get off the ground. Uh, one of the reasons probably is the prominence of scientists and science uh, in the process. Uh, I don't know of any other intergovernmental process which has that sort of emphasis on expertise and experts high uh, in, the pro in the procedures and the processes and the way it works. And it is the great value of the IPCC that that still uh, rides high over all of the many attributes uh, we look in people involved in the work of the IPCC. Uh, this was an issue uh, the Academy reviewed amongst many others. Uh, and I think it's one of the things within the threads that has come through that process uh, as strong, if not stronger, perhaps, than it was going into the review. Uh, as most people here know, this was a response to the controversy after Climate Gate and a, a whole lot of other negative comments about the IPCC. And it was agreed between the UN system and the chair of the IPCC that it would be good to get a completely independent body to come in and review the way we work uh, and the way we manage the IPCC. It has had a significant impact uh, in the management. There is now a new executive committee, a much more transparent process for making decisions. Uh, transparency is a key almost through all of these, opening up the way we work to the general public and to any who are interested in the work of the IPCC. No longer just trust us, we're scientists, but showing and exposing the way we work and trusting that we work in a way which everyone will respect and honour if we're transparent and open. Procedures, a lot of work that's been done on that. Transparency, again, is the key. The handling of errors was an issue in the review and I think now we have a process which I think is working well much more immediate, much more transparent, much more responsive as errors are being uh, identified. And we're still identifying areas uh, in the fourth assessment. Communicate, I'll go to the last one first, conflict of uh, interest. This again was highlighted uh, in the review as something that the IPCC, if not being slack, was just not giving enough serious attention to. Now, every author involved in any chapter has gone through a conflict of interest process, and I think the IPCC uh, and its bureau will be much, much stronger for this process being in place. 
And finally, communications. Uh, if there's one real key message that we learnt is that our game in IPCC around communicating and around outreach had to go up, if not just a notch, it had to go up many notches. And I think the way the special report on extremes has been managed is the first instalment, I think, on a new IPCC and a new role and energy in communications. Uh, I borrowed a lot of slides here from, from Chris and from the TSU. Chris always likes to throw in a couple of cartoons, so I've left those in there. I think Chris, whenever he's talking about the process, uh, likes to highlight the role of communications. Chris and the TSU that this Chris here heads, I think have put a lot of energy into thinking about the way we communicate, what the key messages are about the responsibility for communication, uh, and even training authors uh, and people in the Bureau to be better communicators. And I think I see a much improved IPCC and a very strong working group too for the fact that they've invested in this area. So thanks, Chris. I'll finish there with yet another cartoon from the other Chris, Chris Phil. Thank you very much. <laughs>